I have never heard anything that says Christ is the beginning power. And yet that is what this translation says. We are going to look into the book of Colossians because we want to see what really went on in those churches that existed uh, from about AD 50 until about AD 90. It was about AD 93 when the last of the apostles left this earth. And while the apostles were here, they were able to keep their fingers on everything that went on. The apostles stood for truth. The apostles had all the truth. The apostles themselves, individually, did not have error. The churches had error. That's why we have the epistles. But despite the error, the apostles were able to overcome it by telling those who would listen what the truth was. And what the truth is, we read today, to some extent, in the translations of our Bibles. Colossians chapter 1 starts off. And I must say that this subject now is Christ, the holder of the first place. Paul sets out to write to the church in Colossae. And he says, from an apostle of Jesus Christ to the people devoted to God and fellow believers in Christ. Paul told them who the Christ was. He said Christ is the portrait, a painting or a drawing of the invisible God he said Christ inherited everything. And as I was going through the book of Colossians again, I have read it many times, I was absolutely in awe at the exaltation of Jesus Christ. And I thought to myself, I have never really heard this very much in churches. We read about it in the New Testament. But then you have to think about what Paul says concerning Jesus Christ. And he said, all creation, everything is in Christ. This is because all things were created by him, by Christ himself. Christ created the angels. He created the principalities and powers of the angels, the good angels. Christ was before all of this. He existed in eternity. Then the Apostle Paul speaks about the people, the believers. And he said, Christ is the head of his body, the church, the ecclesia, and it, Christ has dominion in everything. Now in every denomination you could say Christ is not the head of any denomination. Some large uh, parts of Christendom claim that their head is the representative of Jesus Christ. Well, he is no more a representative of Jesus Christ than any pastor or any bishop or any archbishop or any elder. As a matter of fact, even though it is an office, it was not necessarily designated by Christ. There has been many a, a preacher who went into the ministry for it to be a career. Now you could not say that he had been particularly called by God. What we need to understand 
is that the body of Christ consists of people. And that it consists of people from every denomination, I do believe. I believe there would be a few in this and a few in that. Many in this one, many in that one. And who are we to be able to distinguish from one class of people in one denomination to another? Only God knows the hearts. Now Christ was there before everything else. Christ is the source or head of the ecclesia. The head does not mean the boss. He's the source. He's the source of life. He's the source of light. He's the source of everything of which his ecclesia consists. No man is the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the source of the true ecclesia. This is a wonderful translation. He is the beginning power. Did you realize that about Jesus Christ? He is the beginning power. Now we think of the power of God and you can do theological studies on the being of God, much of which is based on the Old Testament. I have never heard anything that says Christ is the beginning power. And yet that is what this translation says. Because he is the first one who rose from the dead. Now, as we look at the scriptures, we see God raised Jesus from the dead. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus himself raised himself from the dead. It, there are verses in the scripture that tell us that. Now, he is the first fruits of them that die. There is yet to come a harvest of people who will rise from the dead. It will be the harvest of many who will rise from the dead when he comes again in his second coming. Many more will arise at the coming of the Lord. He arose and went back to heaven. We as believers will arise and go with him to live in his heaven forever. We will never come back to this present earth. That is a myth. You do not find a verse in the whole of the New Testament that says, Jesus Christ is going to bring the Ecclesia back to earth. You do not find a verse in the New Testament that says, Jesus Christ is going to descend to earth again. You do not find a verse that says, Jesus Christ is going to descend and stand on the Mount of Olives. Not one verse. Let alone a verse that says, millions of people are going to come down there into that small land. No, our hope is to live in heaven with Jesus Christ forever. Christ is the first power. Now that is a title. And I am quoting from a Bible called The Source, from a New Testament. Now the translator of Greek, who was a great classic scholar of Greek, and had access to manuscripts to which the original translators of our New Testament did not have because their reason has said it's a title. And this New Testament is called the source. The translator happens to have been in a university about three or four hundred miles from where we live. Very strange indeed. Dr. Anne Nyland of the New England University. 
a woman. Do you know that the Amplified New Testament that people read that they have was tr done by a woman? So do not despise what some women scholars do. Now this is also what Paul told them in Colossae and he tells us. What Christ did for them and for us, what he did for the believers and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Paul wanted them to know everything about what Christ did. He wanted them to be given every kind of power spiritually. Now what I am doing is taking from the words of the New Testament and putting it in a simple English that everybody can understand. And the way that they would have every kind of spiritual power, every kind, the, the book of Colossians said, it would come to them through God's own mighty power. We should ask ourselves, is this my experience? Paul said they must keep in the knowing and experiencing these things he was speaking about. Do we? You know, one often reads parts of the Bible and thinks, yeah, I should really be doing that with all of my heart. And then we forget. There's a lot in the New Testament that we are supposed to obey. So we need to be going over it and over it because we do forget. And when we go over it again, we remember that we've read it before or heard it before. This is what Paul said, what God did for them and for us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. God made us all fit or suitable to understand what we inherit. It's in the first chapter. God made you fit. God made me fit to be able to understand what we inherit. So there is no excuse for not knowing what our inheritance is because he placed within us the ability to understand. This is something else that Christ did. He took us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. Our sins are taken away. The power of sin over us is no longer there. And we should not feel guilty if we trip up into some sin. There is provision made in the first epistle of John, chapter 1. If we sin, if, said John. And further on he says, if we say we have no sin, we are liars. This is Christians. We are liars. And the truth is not in us. So this is what we are to do. We are to confess it. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now in reality, sin has no power over us. And for the average Christian, they never murder, they never steal, they never bash people. There is a certain godliness in every believer who follows the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross to give us power over sin. It's the cross of Christ and what he accomplished that is our inheritance. He sacrificed himself for us. He brought it about. He ransomed us. We were slaves to sin and Satan. He brought us back to himself with a price. He redeemed us or ransomed us. The price was his blood. Now Christ made a peace deal, if you like, between God 
and us. Not between us and God. Between God and us. Because it was God who was afar off because of our enmity to him. So there had to be peace made. We had to be reconciled to God so that God's peace should avail for us. And Jesus Christ did this through and in his eternal spirit as God. He is our media, mediator. He took our hand and put it in God's hand. He did this because he could. He became a man so that as God and man, he could make peace. He made peace by the blood of his cross. This Christ lives in us. He has all wisdom. Paul wanted them to know everything about what Christ did. He wanted them to be given every kind of power spiritually. 